Hi everyone and welcome to the Imagining a New We video blog with me, Dr. Samantha Gutrera, a video series designed to help history teachers and other history educators teach history in ways that are more transformative, meaningful, and inclusive for their students. We are continuing our series on pandemic pedagogy, if you will, um, uh, talking with different people in the history and heritage communities about what they think about history and teaching history during these pandemic times. And we have another great uh, guest today. I'm going to say that every time because I just feel so lucky to have so many of these people share their time with me and their uh, their opinions and their expertise with all of you. Um, and I hope you appreciate them too. Anyway, we're talking with Kat Ackerfeld today. Kat is the executive director and postmistress of the Toronto's First Post Office Museum in Toronto, Canada. The Toronto's First Post Office is a small independent museum in Toronto that is also still a work working post office. It uh, has a museum, it has a learning program, it has an amazing social media presence, um, but it is also still a post office, so it's actually open during this time because it is an essential service. Um, it is going to be so awesome to talk with Kat today to be able to learn about her experience in both this heritage field but also this essential service field and what that has been like for her. So let's go over to Zoom and say hi to Kat. Hi, Kat. Thank you so much for talking with us today. Um, I thought before we start, you could um, just tell everyone a little bit about Toronto's first post office before we just like dive right into the questions. So um, you're the executive director of the Toronto's first post office. It's a small independent museum. What else can you tell us about it? Oh my gosh. Well, yes, it is a, uh, <laughs> it's a small museum with a, a small staff. So it's basically uh, myself and my job is to keep the doors open and uh, keep things running as smoothly as possible. Then we have um, Zoe, who's our uh, curator and her job is to keep the museum going. So she does all the good stuff like um, uh, our social media. She does uh, education programming exhibits, basically, and she is an entire museum in, 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 to herself. Uh, and then we have a group of postal clerks as well, because within our museum, we have a, uh, a postal counter, which uh, is goes back to uh, the 1980s as part of our fundraising to, uh, to, like I say, we're an independent museum. So we re really rely on uh, grants, donations, and all kinds of fundraising, including having a post office within our museum. I, um, as you know, I did a couple tours back in the day when I was an interpreter there. Uh, and I always thought it was so great the type of learning um, activities that you have in such a small space. Could you talk just a little bit again before we get started about some of the um, like the learning activities that you have when we aren't in this pandemic pause? Yeah, we have, well, our standard program uh, involves writing letters the way they did uh, when our post office, which is a National Historic Site, uh, when it first opened in the 1830s, people in Toronto were uh, writing letters to um, family that they had, you know, left behind. This is a, a was a city of uh, very recent uh, immigrants at that point. So. Um, communication was really important and that's actually part of our museum mandate is to talk about um, the history of communication especially around um, the early part of the, the city's history so when um, when we have programs here we have students um, write it's really hands-on they're writing with quills and ink and the, even the kind of paper that they would be using in the 1830s um, sealing it with uh, sealing wax and a, a seal and then uh, mailing it using our, our post office. So um, we also do, that's like I say, our standard program, um, which we, uh, we do with uh, usually grade threes, grade fours, but we have other programs for younger students, for mixed uh, age groups, like we would usually see in the summer with day camps and so on, um, and for adults as well. So. One of the, the nice things about being an independent museum is we're very um, adaptable to different kinds of groups and, uh, and we can experiment. So we can, if a group comes to us with special uh, requirements, special needs, we can, we can usually make that work for them. Uh, we do walking tours in the, the old town neighborhood. 
Um, and I remember actually, I, you and I worked together uh, in education programming for a while. And I remember, Sam, I think some of your the ideas that you brought in back then are still with us today. I remember you bringing in like movement. Uh, so we're not just sitting for an hour and a half. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's so great. I mean, I, I didn't do a lot, but it was so great to see how like an independent museum runs and then like the openness for, um, for experimentation, like you said. And what's been really great is that since you came as executive director, um, like, the social media presence has like increased. There's so many like cool things happening with like the bullet journals and the letter writing and like a paper fair. <laughs> and uh, anyway, it's just been really cool to watch. And I guess that leads into uh, a less than, you know, a less than like exciting uh, conversation about then how does this shift with the pandemic so the first question i've been starting with for a lot of people is like i think that my view of history has changed a bit because during this time because we can't just think of it as this kind of um for lack of a better word like this leisure activity that we can like pick up and put down when we walk but rather it's this thing that needs to like live and breathe if it's going to be useful during this moment so I don't know if you want to comment a little bit about whether or not your vision of history has changed much in thinking about your museum during this time. Definitely. It's a little bit, like I say, that it's a, it's something that we're grappling with right now, especially as we're looking into farther into the future than we had hoped that the museum is going to be closed. Um, we had hoped that maybe it would just be, you know, a month or two of, uh, of canceling events and we would catch up. And then we're starting to think about how do we do what we do, which is, is such a, like I say, hands-on and experiential activity. How do we do that virtually? Is it, does it have the same kind of value? Does it, does it have the same kind of lessons uh, uh, as it would? It's, I think it really makes a difference and that's something that we're, we're grappling with right now. Um, we are we are setting up, you know, um, online uh, workshops uh, going forward. We're starting with workshops that are geared to uh, to adults, just to kind of stick our toe in the water a little bit. That seems to be a little bit easier to manage, and then and then we'll see what we can do for teachers and uh, and for students after that. Uh, whether it's a, like a recorded session, but. Yeah, it's really, it's, it's, it's gonna involve a lot of experimentation in itself, um, figuring out what, what value we can bring. So this is gonna be like a real, like meta observation and question, so I apologize in advance. <laughs> um, but like we initially met as uh, interpreters at Black Creek Pioneer Village, a living history museum that's like about pioneer days. And um, a lot of these, these like pioneer type museums uh, started in the 1960s and like through the 1980s that was a real like this nostalgia for a particular moment in the past and so I feel like a lot of like pioneer museums are, have really been struggling with how to update the work that they do which is analog for lack of a better term in this world but i feel like this is going to force it even more um could you maybe talk a little bit about how you're thinking of um bringing these lessons from the uh, 1830s to to this 2020 audience because we can't interact in person anymore but that so much of your work is based in this like original kind of nostalgic interpretation. I have a whining cat. I don't know if you can hear that. <laughs> um, well, it's what we've always done is, um, you know, this, um, the experience of a student in the 1830s in a lot of ways is really removed. And even in the last, uh, I don't know how old are millennials now, like, you know, 30 years, these digital natives, they're so far removed <laughs> in, uh, in that experience. So really, uh, you know, I've, I've noticed the change in the last few years when, uh, if I'm doing uh, education programs, um, you really have to start with what is the common experience between somebody living in 
um, Toronto in the first year that it was a city and Toronto in the 186th year that, it, <laughs> that it's a, a city. Um, and that's how you, you make that connection for, uh, for a child and then they kind of have somewhere to get a foothold, um, if you see what I mean. They can see that this is a, a real person. Um, I remember a, a, few, a few years ago now explaining, I think, you know, well, this is why this paper is made from wood pulp and this paper is made from cotton rag and, you know, we can feel the difference in looking at that. And I had a student in kind of the front row put up her hand and say to me, okay, but how, you're telling me no internet. <laughs> and uh, I said, yes. <laughs> and she's like, but then how did people know things? <laughs> like, and, and that really kind of, I think I maybe just stood there for a few minutes like, oh, okay. That's it. There, <laughs> you know, it's, well, I got to take a few steps back here and, uh, and start with a, with a much bigger picture of uh then then you know okay well here's a big pen here's a, a feather you know that <laughs> right so, right I, I, yeah it's really not I, I shouldn't be starting with the tiny little details so we, we need to be looking bigger picture and and so it's it's sometimes hard when we're when we're especially when we're talking to uh you know grade threes grade fours um you don't really want to start with talking about like kind of um the immigration experience or like big topics like that cholera you know yeah. um but uh but when we're talking about kind of big experiences like that um it is a it is a little bit easier for these students to kind of find themselves in there so it it is i think that's kind of a, a good sign when we're going into like i say not so much a hands-on not so much a connected experience a, a, a person to person in the same room um sort of experience if we can uh if we can start with these these big ideas um maybe we don't maybe it's it's a little bit easier to make those connections if you see what I, if you see what i'm going for here. yeah no totally and i think that i mean i guess that was kind of what i wanted to like get at when I was saying this element about nostalgia, like I think in the, I, I mean, again, this is kind of bigger picture, but I think in the 1960s, it was like, let's just revere these old timey ways without these like bringing in about how your current experience can help you make sense. And so I think that's really useful because, you know, I remember when I was working at um, Black Creek and I was in the manse and I had said to a group of students, like this is the minister's house. And a grade three student said to me, um, well, how does the prime minister get elected? And I was like, what now? But it was because uh, he was a, like the young boy was an immigrant. He um, probably wasn't Christian, right? So he wasn't thinking of like minister, he was thinking of prime minister. And that was like, okay, that's right. We have to like keep shifting our points of reference for yeah. these students. So. Do you think your points of reference when you're going to be teaching history after this or during this is, is going to shift? Um, how do you think you're going to, or do you think you're going to teach history differently after this? Definitely. It's oh, always shifting. I, I know when um, for a while I was working at uh, Gibson House up in North York and we talked a lot about toys and children's activities there and I think that started and exactly like you say the uh, kind of a nostalgic look at like you know these are the games of our past um but I always kind of use that as a way of asking the students like hey what's the what's the big gift this Christmas like what are y'all uh, looking for so that I could use that with the next group to say oh this is the I don't know <laughs> whatever the big <laughs> is this year I'm a little out of touch um uh, uh of the past you know just so I could, could kind of uh um you know make that connection for them here i'm always talking about uh just to go off on this little tangent i'm always talking about um jenny lind uh singing at st lawrence hall and of course you know i'm like jenny lind the swedish nightingale right oh right <laughs> swedish nightingale <laughs> yeah and so for a while i'm like she was like the Britney Spears of her day. Now, if I say that to a kid today, that's, you know, Britney Spears. What? Yeah, I'm just like, that is also old, yeah. <laughs> yes, I know, I've been here a while. So, so it's, uh, it's always kind of updating, but I, also that is for, um, you know, less, less, you know, frivolous topics too. Um, when, uh, you know, I do talk about cholera an awful lot when, um, 
uh, if I'm doing walking tours, we go to St. James uh, Park and, and uh, of course they had the cholera burial grounds in behind there. Um, and so I'm, I'm talking about like what that is experiencing. Like and kids, they love the kind of gore and grossness of it. So sometimes, you know, I really lay it on as, you know, unless we're just we're doing it right after lunch or anything or something. But, um, uh, but now that's going to be harder because definitely if you know that the news is correct these kids that if i ever see them in person again um are gonna have connections with somebody no no, no. <laughs> you know knock on wood but uh they might have somebody in their family who has suffered from a big pandemic you know um a, a medical disaster that affects communities and so that's not gonna i'm not going to approach it in the same kind of like oh here's the gross out sort of sort of way yeah um you know I, like i say i've been here forever so we went through that same thing when we were talking about cholera um you know oh how many years ago was this now that it was in haiti you know um and i have you know toronto is still a city of immigrants and so i had you know i was having uh, kids in my group that had close connections uh with haiti so it was um <laughs> you know, you have to you have to uh, think about where your audience is coming from, for sure. You know, that's interesting that you say that, and I really appreciate you bringing that up. It actually hasn't come up in the conversation before. So, uh, one of the academic papers that I've done, that I actually the first one that I I filmed. So I'm just plugging another video on my YouTube thing right now about connection, complexity, and care. But I was saying that I went to the African American National History Museum in Washington, D.C. And I was um, uh, I was standing in line to see Emmett Till's coffin, which is um, an amazing artifact that they have. And I was standing behind a group of five students, and um, three of them were white students. One of them um, uh, looked like a, a South Asian student uh, who may have been a first generation American, and then another student who was African American. And the paper was just like, all five of those students are going to be dealing with this topic and understanding so much of this history differently that what experience do we ensure is held and is safest? Um, and I think that for you highlighting that like, yeah, I talked about cholera, but then I had to realize I was gonna, I was connecting with students in ways that I didn't realize and I had to like figure out how that works. I think bringing in, like being thoughtful about that affect is really useful. So thank you, thank you for that. Because I think too, when we get back, back, right? Whatever that looks like, anxieties are gonna be so, so high, right? And that we really need to be thoughtful about that. So, yeah. I, sorry, yeah. So I was just gonna, gonna say to you that like, in when we're, we're thinking about history and especially with topics that draw such a clear line to what's going on today, um, you know, you're talking about what happened then and you're also talking about what happened next back then. Right, right, right. So yeah, so you're you you are playing a big part in these students' mind. Like, how do they think about what happened, what is happening now, with you know that knowledge of what happened then and what happened next back then? If you see what yeah. I mean. So yeah, <laughs> so, yeah well, like they all like, have some idea. Like these 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 moments in history have these different threads from it, and those threads don't lead to the present. They, lead, they all lead to the present, but they don't take the same route for everyone, right? That we have to kind of acknowledge that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I guess, so anyway, thank you for that. Because again, no one has really highlighted that. And I, I really appreciate that perspective. Um, so that, that leads to my next question about imagining a new we. So I like to argue that it can be very easy for people to say like, this is Canadian history and this is other. Um, and that one way that we need to build a more transformative, meaningful and inclusive version of the uh, future is to think of that as the past. So also these like increasing circles of inclusion. And I was really wondering um, how or what that might look different when we get back or during this time, does imagining change? Does a we change? I don't know if you want to comment on that at all, um, uh, about whether or not you think we will imagine a new we or we should be imagining a new we uh, differently during or after this moment. 
Uh, I def I definitely think so. Um, Yay, good. We have been yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> we have been working. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, I have been working with um, our board here on, for the past couple of years, we've been looking at our strategic plan and looking at our, our kind of big vision. And every time it comes comes time to renew that, uh, that plan, we go back to our original mission statement and our original mandate and think about is this, is it still applicable you know is it is it time to change this is it time to expand it and you're exactly right we're a youngish museum we were uh you know established in the 1980s but there was still uh, a lot of that kind of nostalgic looking back and a very um like our our mission uh statement is looking at the, the history of communication in the town of york period and the early city so that's a very short period of time um and also looking at postal history until the 1850s. Again, it's a very short period of time. Um, it doesn't say anything about whose experience it is. And this is something that they would they weren't thinking in the 80s because like you say, they're thinking a pioneer um, in a funny hat, you know, that's the, that everybody would have known who they're thinking of. And so it wasn't really explicit. Um, I think the problem right now, even before this happened, was that we understand that that that's what they were thinking back then. We understand who they, um, when this museum was set up, who they were, whose stories they were telling. And I think now it's time to expand that because we still have, if you look at the, the makeup of, uh, of the community that we're serving, it's really similar to the, the um, experience of the, the community that was that was here in the 1830s and we haven't been telling all of those stories. We've been telling the stories of like the you know the accepted pioneer, the, the stories that we've been told for so long. So I'm looking at this as an excuse to kind of like expand that uh, that vision of expand that mandate a little bit and uh, and tell some more stories. Yeah because I think that especially with like the history. Uh, so I, I would. Sorry, I just have my cat that brought me a ball to play fetch with. <laughs> so I'm just letting you know. Okay, I have that at my feet. Um, I think that like the history of communication can really help us explore the communication between and amongst cultures. And I don't just mean like racial or cultural cultures. You know what I mean? Um, but all, like a variety of different types of culture. And I think of at Black Creek Pioneer Village, for example, where there's a house that is um, uh, like a house with someone that's Scottish and Irish and English and German, um, and uh, and like to talk about how there is still um, there's still these cultural differences, even when everyone looks white. And I think that like you wanting to expand who we talk about in the we for your museum, I. I'm really excited to see what that looks like when and how that gets developed. Yeah, so am I. We have we have items no in pressure. our collection. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we have. Well, I mean, that it's been brewing for a while. Like I say, even before this, um, we have items in our collection. Some of which we've just only just uh, acquired in the last uh, year or so that tell, like I say, these these stories of these people of the early town that that don't get told a lot you know we have um here in in this neighborhood we had uh you know we had experiences of of uh the irish who were escaping uh famine we have the stories of the um there seemed to be an awful lot of um, uh, black entrepreneurs who uh who yeah. set up shop here and uh, and and you know a lot of great uh, great stories there as well as you know the the story that kind of we've been telling so far which is of the you know dozen or so names that uh, that we can all run off uh you know the of the, the the wealthy guys who were uh, right. basically taking all the jobs <laughs> right so, like so often people will be like oh well those people weren't in the past and uh, it's like, well, do we actually know their stories? Like, they might not be in history, but they certainly were in the past. Like, do we know their histories? Are we, or do we look for them? Do we have the, um, do we have the artifacts and the records to to show? Do we have the oral histories that show? So that's awesome that your collection is well. Amazing. 
Yeah, it's the nice thing about being a postal museum is a lot of a lot of stuff is written down. <laughs> <laughs> um, Kat, this has been so amazing. Um, this has been such a really great and invigorating talk and such a wonderful way to end the week. Um, before we say goodbye, uh, do you want to talk about how people can support uh, your work at the Toronto's First Post Office? I certainly do. <laughs> that would be fantastic. So um, our website is the town of York, uh, sorry, townofyork.com. And uh, at the bottom of that page, you can find a nice big uh, red support, uh, a donate now button. Um, but even better, oh, sorry, not red, green, my goodness. Oh, no, um, if, when I put my, my little cursor on it. You there you go. Yeah. So, <laughs> so that's, an, uh, that's a really quick and, uh, and lovely way to support us. But uh, even more than that, we love expanding our community. So right beside that, there's a join our mailing list. If you, uh, if you sign up there, you'll hear about all of our activities, whether they're virtual or in person, fingers crossed, um, and uh, and all our updates as uh, as we go forward into this uh, this unknown. Yeah, I um I have always just loved the work that um, that you all do at uh, the Toronto Post Post Office. I'm so glad that we were able to um, talk about it and uh, and share this work today. This has been such a great talk. Thank you again. Um, and yeah, let's, uh, let's stay connected. It's, I, I end, I've been ending all the talks like that just because to me, this has really been such a great moment to show the type of community that we can build to help support, like support this, these uncertain times. I have like, I just want to highlight that I have just this happening right now. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel like, it's like, anyway, um, so thank you so much, Kat. This has been great. Thank you, Sam, and uh, and it's good to talk to you. We'll talk again soon. I know, I know. Let's do that. Okay, bye. Right. Bye. Thank you.